welcome to the chapel of Robinson College here at the University of Cambridge. This term, our theme follows the idea of voices from outside the window, and we have in mind in particular the Overton window, a shorthand way of describing what is widely deemed to be the socially acceptable range of opinion and discourse. Today we're very pleased to welcome Peter Hitchens, a journalist and author, and we discuss in particular his latest book, The Phony Victory. We begin our discussion with a brief reading from the New Testament. Peter Hitchens, a very warm welcome to Robinson College Chapel. One of the Cambridge chapels, I'm afraid I haven't actually visited. <laughs> Not many people have. It's one of our best kept secrets, I think. Um, well, it's an ecumenical chapel in its foundation. And for that reason, we are at liberty to be much more open in the people that we invite to speak, which is part of the reason we're doing a series on people who are widely regarded as... Um, perhaps societally heretic or blasphemous or something like that. Gosh. Um, <laughs> not that I'm accusing you of that, but you I are... Like, I have the worst things to say about me every day. I've never seen that. <laughs> I mean, I'm, not, you... I, I'm not sure I object to heretic anyway. No, no, that's true. It's a very late I invention. I am one. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a badge of honour. Part of the reason that we have invited you is that you do occupy a space outside the acceptable range of public discourse, the Overton window, as you as you mentioned. Um, and I just wondered if you might say a little more about your experience of being outside of that window. Yeah, well, I, you feel sometimes a strong sense of personal dislike. It's not my opponents are not just my opponents; they're in many cases my enemies, and. They regard what I say not just as, as wrong, but as bad. And, and as a result, they regard me as bad. And that's that, really. They wouldn't, well, some of them might be prepared to share a studio with me and to discuss things with me in, in polite terms. Some, but many mm -hmm. not. Others would, would not want to share the same postcode, let alone have me around a dinner or meet me for a drink. There is a, it, it is very personal. If you don't. If you don't abide by the, the, the current orthodoxy of, really on, on moral and social questions particularly, mm. uh, you do risk being a pariah. And it's much worse for me because I am a former, I am a former Leninist and I, I was for many years a revolutionary socialist. I, after that, I was a member of the Labour Party. And so I'm, I, I'm regarded by some people as a traitor. And then I have the other problem, which is that my late brother, was of course a much beloved figure broadly of the left that he confused them at the end too quite a bit mm. uh, and, and, and I have the same name and my voice is similar and I think some of them feel to so return to the word you used at the beginning that my very existence is a sort of blasphemy against the name of Hitchens they think I'm not entitled to, to hold it so, so sometimes people write to me on Twitter and say uh, how on earth could you be related to Christian Hitchens? And I reply, same parents. You've got any other questions that I can answer <laughs> easily? Uh, it, but it, they, they really don't like it, and you can feel them not liking it. And it's, it's I, I, tell you, I understand it. I think it's silly, but I understand it. Uh, and, uh, and then there is the other issue. For a lot of people, uh, a religious belief, particularly a Christian belief, hmm. is verges on the offensive to them. Uh, they actually find it uh, outrageous that anybody who's plainly been educated and can read uh, should uh, should resort to this uh, superstitious uh, rubbish, as they believe it to be, 
and they're disturbed by it. They're disturbed by it because they're terrified deep down uh, that maybe the same thing could happen to them. And so that that also in, informs uh, a lot of the way people treat me. But I, uh, I, I've been a, an outsider in one way or another all, all my life, really, since I was in preparatory school. And I enjoy it. Uh, in any case, which is a good thing. I don't mind it. Uh, there are times when it can get a bit much, actually, being pelted with slime over and over again when you're trying to conduct some reasoned argument and all you get back in return is personal abuse. But, you know, I have not, um, I've not succumbed to it. I have many strong supports in my private life which, which help me to stand up to it. So, uh, mm. so I take it as a reasonable price to pay for the great benefits uh, that I receive. Uh, from being able to be in the in the great public debate anyway. It's huge. It's, first of all, you might be able to influence people. Secondly, there is something immensely uh, stimulating to the mind hmm. about taking part in, in debate with serious opponents who, uh, who, are, who, who could trip you up and show you to be wrong and make a fool of you and uh, therefore force you to think at a higher rate and a, and a better level than you otherwise would have done. Well, you genuinely have something to say, don't you? But... Before I ask you a little I, more... But they, they, they don't necessarily agree with me about that. <laughs> so you were talking about sort of the superstitious rubbish. Is that something that you believed while you were a Leninist? Oh, very much. I was, I was, uh, I, I was the Trotskyist uh, revolutionary socialist. I was uh, okay. personally bohemian. I was um, absolutely... I mean, there is, a, there is an absolute um, barricade. Uh, which I believe can't be crossed between uh, b- between revolutionary socialism and uh, uh, particularly the Christian religion. Uh, I think the the origin of it is is the Christian belief that that man is made in the image of God and is therefore fundamentally unalterable, uh, whereas the revolutionary believes uh, fundamentally that man can be changed and a new man can be constructed, and that, that's really the beginning of it. But utopianism, okay. earthly utopianism, is a deadly foe. Uh, of, of of a belief in, 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 in eternal justice, so I, I was very hostile indeed and uh, jeeringly hostile to religion. So I know, as in so many other aspects, I know what my opponents think of me because I used to think it. Hmm. And it's difficult, I suppose, when you when you've got people on the right um, criticizing you for being too far left. And people on the left criticising you for being too far right. Presumably, you've experienced both. I don't know about that. I, mean, I think just, what I've mainly experienced is people people getting angry because I say something they they, they suspect might be true. <laughs> what this is this is the, the root of all anger and argument. Certainly, had what used to get me angry you know, was somebody says something that I suspected was true and very much wanted to believe it was not true, uh, and that would really it raised me more than anything else and I, I like to think that that's why I'm expressing the inward doubts of my opponents I've never heard that expressed that way before that's really interesting that when you evoke anger from others it's often because they're doubting the foundations of where they're standing uh, yeah anger, anger anger in argument is almost invariably a protection against reason and people you you quite possibly have been through the experience of changing your mind I certainly have hmm. And the thing that you struggle very hard not to do so, because you know, uh, I think, fundamentally, that one of the things that's going to happen to you is you're going to lose all your friends, your whole life is going to be turned upside down, and it's, it's so you know that there's something beyond that door uh, that you ought to accept, but you don't want to open the door, because in the process of opening it, you're, 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 you're going to bring an earthquake uh, into your whole existence. So you, don't, so you fight against it, and anybody who points mm-hmm. out this to you at the time that you're you're doing it, or even before you've even begun to contemplate it, that will be the person who really, really makes you angry. This is Plato in the cave, by the sound of it, but it, it's very close as well to the uh, biblical notion of repentance. It's this capacity to move on from a mindset that you've comfortably inhabited. To something else, uh, metanoia. It's, it's after your mind has been made up. You move somewhere else. It's terrifying, as you described. Are you old enough to remember Ronan Point, the tower block that collapsed? Uh, it was a small gas gas cooker explosion, and it, 
this entire tower block in the east end of London just fell down, uh, the whole corner of it. Fortunately, not many people, I think, were, were hurt because they, were, they weren't in that corner of the block at the time. But it was, and the, the, the term for it was progressive collapse. And if you, had you been at the top of that building, you um, down, down, floor after floor after floor after floor, and the sensation of changing your mind is much like that because you think that you can just change your mind about X. But yeah. you suddenly find that once X is gone, then Y is, 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 is trembling too, <laughs> and then that goes. And then the next thing goes, and, and it's just, uh, and, and at the same time, as the personal effects, you find that people who, with whom you were previously on good terms won't even talk to you in many cases. If, you, mm. if, if, if you're, you know, one of the oddest things that happened to me in my entire life, uh, because I never wanted to be a, 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 a I, I was never hostile to my former comrades. I disagreed with them, but they didn't, I, but was, I was on a, a one of the local papers I had to work on to get do my apprenticeship before coming to London, and I was asked by an editor to do a hatchet job on a on a small group which is which was claimed to be campaigning for the unemployed in that particular city. And I went and looked, and I found out to my absolute horror uh, that several of the people involved were former comrades of mine, or were, or in some cases belonged to an organisation I, I recently left. I thought I can't do this. I mean, I although actually. I quite agreed with the O.S. that they were up to no good. I certainly couldn't turn coppers knock on these people. And I think that if I hadn't, uh, during that week, been offered a job on a Fleet Street paper, which I was, I think I would have been fired uh, for the ridiculous thing of refusing to, to re re refusing to denounce people I actually very, very strongly disagreed with. But, that, it, 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 but they uh, would not have been in any way grateful for this nicety. Uh, their view of it would have, would have been that the, the problem was mine. I should never have, I should never have deserted the cause. Mm. And I sometimes have met in, in various circumstances people who I used to be on reasonable terms with in the in, in the organisation I used to belong to, and the fury uh, mm. is, is has been quite shocking. But you do, you do, you lose. You just lose friends. You gain enemies, and it's it's a, it, it's it's turmoil. It goes on for quite a long time. In fact, I don't believe it's ever stopped since it began. No, no piece. I, I don't look at any flaw, any 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 flaw of thought now. I think, oh, well, that's safe. I know that one's going to stand. You never know what's going to give way next. Once you, um, once you allow yourself to change your mind, then you're 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 you're, you're never safe again. The ground shift. This is Martin Luther. A little baptism every day is what he spoke about. Yeah. He's subjected to that experience on a daily basis. I wouldn't quite say daily, but it does, it does go on, and it's disturbing. And you, and you, I still fight it. Mm. There's still things I, I, I fight off. I, I can't. I'm not doing that. Can I ask but you that? Something tells me I ought to. Yeah. Can I move towards your um, not your most recent book, Unconventional Wisdom, your 2018 publication, Phony Victory. Yes. about what happened in the Second World War, and perhaps as a window into how you relate in public today. The first question I always want to ask about a, a book is why, why it was written. And at, at the outset, you mentioned your, um, your parents, your father in particular, and at the end. As you mentioned your father a, a, a few minutes ago, what kind of an impact would your parents have had on the way that you shaped your opinion on what happened during the Second World War? Well, uh, at the time, it wasn't really a parental thing. I, I grew up in this, this time when the war was overshadowed everything. It was a very recent event. It's shocking to me when I think of things which happened in my life which seem recent to me, which are a, a long time ago. The, the war, when I was born, it was only six years in the past. And by the time I became more or less conscious of what was going on around me from the age of five onwards, it was it, it, it was still only 10 or 11 years ago. And yeah. it had been gigantic and it had, it had roared through the lives of my parents and indeed brought them together, uh, but uh, had, had, had completely changed the country in, in which they lived. It was the subject of all discourse. It was, the, it was, we, it was what we, we played games uh, in which the, the Germans and the British fought each other. Uh, we Our toys were... were the dinky toys we had were, were Second World War weapons. Uh, we imagined ourselves in Spitfire dogfights, or in my case, it was commanding destroyers. Uh, oh, you mentioned killed. the airfix models. Oh, yeah, the, the airfix model, HMS Cossack. Yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 and, and all the rest of it, we were, it, it was, it was, 
the form, as I say in the book, of idolatry. Uh, and, and we were completely absorbed there. My parents played the small role. My father didn't talk about it much. And most people who actually been in war don't. In fact, the only time I ever really asked him, he, he would remember, because it was every Boxing Day, we would sort of remember it anyway. He'd remember being at the Battle of the North Cape, where he'd been involved in sinking the, the uh, German convoy raid at the Scharnhorst in very dramatic circumstances. Uh, which had been the most concentrated uh, part of his time on the on the Russian convoys, but apart from that, he wouldn't. In fact, I, when I asked him to describe what it would be like uh, in uh, in HMS Jamaica on the convoys, he said, "Well, I don't really want to go on about it. But if you wanted, to, if you wanted a very good description of, of it, then uh, the, the book by Alistair McLean called HMS Ulysses is the one to go for. It's what it describes is pretty much how it felt." So I did that, and it is quite shocking, the, the hardships which undoubtedly were endured. But they didn't go on about it because it, it was so unpleasant. And I think in many cases, they wanted to put it aside. He was a professional. Uh, he was a, a career naval officer. He had, uh, he trained all his life for war. He wasn't just bound into it from, from a civilian occupation. He, this is what he'd, he'd been trained to do and what he continued to do after the war was over. But he still wasn't, uh, there, there wasn't a, the, the thing which small boys imagine, they, they feeling glory about it. Uh, but he was puzzled, and there's no question he was puzzled about the outcome, because it was quite... Uh, the other thing that uh, sticks in my mind from this period, I'm often accused by my opponents of thinking the 1950s were a golden age. <laughs> it's just so funny. I, mean, I remember the 1950s as freezing cold, chill blades, uh, the in, endless smell of tobacco smoke. Everybody smoked all the time, everywhere, and it disgusted me. Uh, as a dinginess and, and such great <laughs> feeling about everything, that, and, and which I now understand was caused by the fact that the country was in such hopeless debt to the United States, we didn't have any money. Mm. And it was not a period of, 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 that I would ever describe as a, as, as, a, as, as a gold age, and that was that was that was also part of my consciousness. And out of that uh, must have come over a long period a feeling of doubt about the the idea that it was. Uh, it was the greatest event in human history, or, it, 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 or actually that we'd won it. How could a country that had won a war be so poor and battered? Uh, and how could the people who'd been involved in winning it be so unfilled with the, the, the joy of victory? And it was an undercurrent, and I didn't make all that much of it at the time. Yeah. And then people started going on and on about uh, it, when it came to the, the Iraq War, uh, particularly. Uh, we were pretty much told that Saddam Hussein was Hitler and that uh, the Blair creature was uh, Churchill and that uh, George W. Bush was uh, FDR and it was the same thing over again. Yeah. I got to look at this. I found over and over again, whenever any kind of foreign adventure was being proposed, the enemy was always Hitler, the person proposing it was always Churchill and anybody who was against it was always Neville Chamberlain. And I thought, well, this is, this is, this is obvious round objects. Uh, and I began to look into it and, and, and thought it was foolish uh, as a comparison. And then I began to look at the the, the war itself. And I, I began to wonder if the war itself measured up to the billing that had been given. And I found it really didn't. Uh, there's a, a very interesting PhD thesis, which I quote at length in the book, and on which a lot of it hangs, mm. about the actual business of the... The, the, the process of going to war. And what became perfectly evident from this is that, that uh, the, the idea that we had of having got the Second World War is, is just wrong. Uh, Halifax in particular, Neville Chamberlain is slightly less so, uh, were quite anxious to have a war with Hitler and, and, and were very worried that the Poles were going to make a deal with the Germans and so deprive them of the opportunity to have it. They believed uh, that in concert with France, whose military strength they unwisely relied on, uh, they could re-establish their great past status by doing so. And they went into a war, which they had promptly lost. It's so uh, far from the official narrative. It's... Well, I know it is, but it's, as soon as you look at it, that's what you find it's happened. And, and it was after they lost it that Winston Churchill prevented us from then surrendering. And you, the French lost the war and were occupied and subjugated. We lost the war and were not occupied and were able to survive, but only as partners of of much, much bigger powers who took over the same war and used it for their own purposes. That's uh, the shocking thing. Relegating us to a very minor war. One of the um, implications is that you seem to imply 
although Britain didn't win the war, that, that's a myth that's slowly evaporating. We did start it and we had to be rescued. And I can already hear some of my friends I was in the military with tearing out their otic hairs in anger uh, that this is ideological blasphemy. You, no, no. Can you say something about the reaction that you've experienced? Well, I, mean, I, I, I don't, I mean, I, I knew that it, I'd had the book as a book um, that I wanted very much to write this came out of a lengthy arguments I had on my blog with, with readers on, on this subject, on the nature of the war. And they all came back with the, 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 the slander, which is the invariable response to this. Oh, so you think we should have given in to Hitler? Do you, you think we should have made peace with Hitler? I said, absolutely the opposite. I think the greatest thing Winston Churchill ever did was not to make peace with Hitler when it was very tempting. The person who I think probably would have made peace with Hitler was Halifax, who got us into the stupid mess in the first place. I think it was a matter of timing uh, that to, 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 to give to the Polish government, particularly to Colonel Joseph Beck, one of the great scoundrels of history, the power to decide when and under, under what circumstances you go to war uh, with the biggest military power in, in, in Europe mm. is unwise. No one, uh, the, the, the Americans didn't enter the war until 1941 after they'd been bombed by the Japanese. And even then it was some doubt as to whether they go. No one actually reproaches the United States. Uh, for, for having wasted to the more opportune moment to, to come into the war. Uh, if Britain and France had stayed out, who knows what, uh, in 1939, who knows what might have happened? Uh, it, the, the world would have, would have been different, but I think a war with Germany at some point was inevitable, and, and it had to be won. Mm. And I just don't think that September 1939, when the army was exercising with broomsticks on Salisbury Plain, and the Air Force was mostly composed of biplanes, uh, was a particularly bright moment to start it. And also what we didn't seem to have done was any serious estimate of the true strength of France, who, on whose army we relied, or of the Maginot line, which was incomplete, uh, or the fact that we didn't have any armoured divisions to speak of. It, it was, yeah. it, it's, it's a very strange thing. It's, it's like people often laugh at Arthur Scargill for starting a coal strike in the summer. Well, okay, uh, but the, the, the condition in which, in which Britain was militarily in 1939, we were very well prepared for a totally different war. We were prepared for a war in, in, in defence of the empire yeah. and in defence of the homeland against attack. We were not prepared for an aggressive war against a major military power in Central Europe. I mean, it was uh, as it very rapidly turned out, we weren't prepared for it. We were, we were pushed into the sea and the British army was up to its yeah. armpits with salt water at Dunkirk. I had no idea that we had fewer soldiers in Britain than somewhere like Belgium. Oh, the, the British army is tiny. 200,000, um, you mentioned. So, of course, at the time was the American army. And I think the American army at the yeah. time was, 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 was smaller than Portugal's. And it, it, people imagine that everyone was terribly prepared ready. And the, the, and the French army, well, I mean, it, it wasn't, it, 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 it barely had any radio communications as I understand at the time. For so if, if our military attaché in Paris had been as active as our military attaché in Berlin, I think they might have discovered a few worrying things about it. And the other thing was the, the collapse of, the, of, 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 of Belgium into neutrality in 1936 mm -hmm. had rendered the, the, the Maginot line more or less useless because it left it open along a long stretch which with, there was neither time nor money. Uh, to do anything about it. I, look, actually, I'm a great fan of the Maginot Line. I think it's a jolly good idea. If it, if it had been finished, it, it, it would have been very difficult to breach. Uh, but it wasn't, and there was this awful, this awful gap through through, through which, of course, ultimately the um, the enemy were able to come, and which around which their their strategy of luring the French to the north uh, was based. So all this was going on, and it's, it, it seems to me to be reasonable to say why, in that case give a guarantee to Poland, which at the time was an anti-Semitic military dictatorship, which seriously considered, and, uh, which had already since 1934 been in a non-aggression pact with the Germans, and mm -hmm. seriously considered a deal with the, with, with the Germans over, uh, over territory and peace, and was, was not by, and had also taken part in the dismemberment of Czechoslovakia after Munich. It, it's, it's not a, really a matter of going to the rescue of, 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 some, of some marvelous uh, embattled democracy. And then the, the other issue arises, of course, of the, the great event of the 20th century, which nobody in Britain knows anything about, which is the, the Nazi-Soviet pact, uh, probably the central diplomatic event of the, of, the, of the whole century. And what the moment that was concluded 
whatever strategy we based our guarantee to Poland on was ripped to pieces. It, mm. it, it was it was a complete absurdity, and, and yet we continued as if it as if it hadn't been signed. A lot of this is, is was brand new to me when I read it. That's probably because I tend to read sort of the old fashioned table thumping accounts, but. Yeah. You've got a very nuanced um, interpretation of what happened, and you're quite happy to celebrate proper victories and proper heroism at the same time as be ruthlessly critical of stupidity. But e even then, you express discomfort with your own departure from the traditional narrative about the Second World War and how we won it. Because I hated it. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't want to do this. But the, on the other hand, it was I was compelled to do it by, by what seems to me to be the truth about these events, uh, particularly the Polish guarantee. Mm. And I, I don't, I, I don't think there's any way around it. The Polish guarantee. Churchill was terribly critical of the Polish guarantee, uh, and rightly so. Yes, you cited uh, him um, and his no. cynicism. Well, yes, and it's, but this, that, it's, it's, it's from a part of a speech or article, which is other parts of which are quite well known, but that bit is not so well known because the whole issue of the Post Guarantee is not, is not discussed. The Post Guarantee was a shameful thing. Mm. And we guaranteed to come to the aid of Poland knowing, with total certainty, we had, we had no intention of doing so. We were never going to do it. Uh, there was nothing we could do. We didn't have the, didn't have the strength uh, or, or, or the forces or the intention. And everybody who signed that agreement on the British side and all their military advisors who were involved knew that it was a lie. Uh, and yet it, I, I have very little doubt that it changed the behaviour of Poland quite considerably in, mm. in, in, in the ensuing months. Can I move you towards a final question then about the way that history is told and understood? You allude at various points to the ways in which our notion of history in general, and, and World War II in particular, has evolved over time. And contemporary accounts feel simplified, sentimentalised, polarised. Can you account for the shift in public perception um, about how, how simplified World War II narratives today fit into public discourse as it currently functions? Well, it's just, it's, it's, it's really all part of the extremely miserable teaching of, of history now. They do the miserable teaching of practically anything. People don't know anything about the past, and they're incurious about the past as well, because they're increasingly our education system uh, teaches people what to think and not how to think. Hmm. And this is, in fact, in every part of the education system. And my, my next book, I hope, if there, if there are any books to be written in the future, will be about the destruction of the of the... British education system because it was it happened in Scotland and Wales as well as England uh, in the 1960s. The the, the, the smashing up, the vandalisation of uh, very large numbers of fine state grammar schools or their equivalents in Scotland, the academies, uh, to uh, in a in purely political egalitarian reasons, and the consequences of that weren't just that the standards of the state schools dropped, which they did. Because the standards of the private schools dropped as well, because an examination system has to be devised with the state schools in mind. The O level uh, couldn't simply couldn't be coped with by the new comprehensive schools; it had to be scrapped and replaced by the GCFT. And the A level is, is it, when I was when I was at school in the early nineties, it was generally said that a set of English A levels is more or less the equivalent of an American college degree. And who would say that now? Uh, there's no question about the, the, the devaluation of these qualifications and it, it, a, 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 a private school with, which of course can be selective uh, and can exclude people who are no good and all the rest of it and, and has, uh, is able to maintain discipline in its classrooms can, can scoop up great mounds of A star and A grades in any exam you go to name yeah, without yeah. actually stretching uh, any of its pupils academically, and the level of knowledge and understanding in our society has catastrophically dropped mm. uh, since uh, Crossland and then Thatcher uh, destroyed the grammar schools. And we pay for it all the time. We're paying for it now in, in, in inadequate leadership and, and, and uh, the inadequacy generally of the of those classes in society which are supposed to be the brakes on folly, uh, whether it be the the, the teachers, the lawyers. Uh, the, the parliamentarians, the civil servants, people just don't know anything anymore. Yeah. And they, don't, they, have, they have no knowledge of the past, which is the basic experience. You know, if you, the, the man who 
knows nothing of what happened before he was born is forever a child. And uh, we are, we're in a land of children. Knowledge is a disadvantage for A-levels. I, mean, I did an A-level in theology about four years ago so that I could teach it. I taught some A-levels to my kids. And I did the course, and I couldn't score higher than a D or a C. Because you knew too much. Well, I just wasn't playing the game in, because yeah, you're, it's, you're not it's, being trained to know anything. You're being trained to pass exams. It's trained to pass exams, yeah. And it's uh, a it's, it's, that's a different it's, game. It's, it's, that, it, that is a perfect illustration of it. Uh, uh, there have been occasions when I've had to say to my children, no, for heaven's sake, we've been discussing historical subject, well, don't, whatever you do, put that in your exam paper, because it will cause nothing but trouble. It only confused them. Uh, knowledge, knowledge in, in, in journalism, I find knowledge of any subject is deep disadvantage in writing about it. Everybody will say, what do you mean? How do you, how do you say that? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but no, because that's not what was in all the other papers. Where, where do you think it's going to lead? Where, where do you think this sort of lack of education? Well, it's, it's, it, it, we're finished. As a country, we're finished. I've been saying for years. I, mean, I didn't think it would happen so fast. I mean, we, but it, the, the astonishing thing now, where we have, uh, we've spent all the money we never had and a, a, fair bit, a fair bit more than we will never have, uh, on a wholly disproportionate reaction uh, to a, an important but, not, uh, but, but nothing like as big as it's claimed to be uh, epidemic, uh, is probably the end. I don't see how a country which has borrowed that much money, particularly a country with such a bad current account deficit and such vast uh, private debt, uh, is going to survive that in, in anything resembling the shape it now has. And so mm. I, think, I think this is it. This is the moment uh, where, where everything will, will come out and roost at once. Uh, I have to say, I thought I'd be dead by the time this happened, but it looks as if I'm going to still be alive. And not look forward to it all that much. Do, do you see the same thing happening in the US, given what's... Well, they have different problems. I mean, they have a reserve currency, so they can probably continue to, to, um, to, to do foolish things for longer than we have, and the, their economy is, is perhaps the, the strong, but as a society, they are uh, pulling themselves to pieces. Hmm. Uh, and I, I, I do reminisce, I worked in Washington for a couple of years, and I was quite shocked by the arrogance of the, of the liberal class in Washington. I would be at some dinner saying to my so the person on my right at the table, I, who obviously had some idea that I was a right-wing person and therefore awful and was wishing he was somewhere else. So I said, you don't understand. You may think I'm bad and horrible, but I am reasonably educated, literate, coherent. I know some history. I'm tolerant of my opponents. Uh, I believe very much in, 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 in justice and in mercy and I'm capable of civilised discourse. If you continue to treat people like me as if we are pariahs, you wait and see what you get. And the election of Donald Trump seemed to me, I wished I could have found that person. I said, yeah, this is what I told you. This is what, this is what you brought into being by your utter contempt for civilised conservatives, which has been very common. And so you, you brought this into being. And it is, it is your creation. You you decided that you were not going to listen to serious conservative arguments or even treat them with courtesy. And so this is what you get. You get this Yahoo and uh, a mob behind him. And who knows where that will end. But justice, mercy and civilised discourse, this is your... Well, they're all pretty good, aren't they? I think we can all be in favour of them. It's just, you know, it's just that we're against sin. But I'm afraid they're not all that common these days. Hmm. Peter Hitchens, thank you very much. Pleasure.